You're watching the program that identifies market trends, provides insightful analysis, and reliable research. Key elements to help you profit from the pros. Profit from the Pros is brought to you by Zach's Investment Research. Learn more by visiting them online at zax.com. Welcome to another Profit from the Pros. I'm Terry Ruffalo. Stocks hit multi-year highs this week as investors continue to sift through first quarter earnings reports. Investors were keyed into the Fed's policy meeting earlier in the week, which ended with the first of what will become regular news conferences on Fed policy statements. This first conference carried that familiar message of the Fed vowing to continue to stimulate economic growth with low interest rates. But despite that message, Weaker economic data was reported later in the week when the Commerce Department said the U.S. economy grew at a softer-than-expected 1.8 percent in the first quarter, and when the Labor Department said weekly jobless claims rose to their highest total since late January. And we're going to be talking more about that coming up at the roundtable a little bit later on in the program. But right now, our editor-at-large, Steve Reitmeister, joins us once again to kind of help us, guide us through the maze of, okay. of headlines out there. Given the height of the market uh, right now, multi-year highs, the GDP news out this week, Steve, is it abnormal to expect to see some profit taking here in the next yeah. month or so? I, I think there will be profit taking, but not until we probably hit about Dow 13,000. Just given the strength of the uh, earnings uh, reports, given the Goldilocks scenario of the economy growing, but not but not growing so much that the Fed is, you know, the, the, the Fed is going to the sidelines. The Fed is still being accommodative, earnings on the rise. This should take us to 13,000. Probably at that point, and it being the summer, which is generally kind of a choppy time, I expect there to be a little bit of profit taking there, and then we probably play around a range for a while between the old highs of 12,400-ish and, and 13,000 for a while. And if we did see some profit taking, that's not going to be abnormal given, again, the height of the market. Yeah. I mean, here, you, you got you know, which trend are we looking at? The long-term trend is clearly bullish because, you know, we, we've come up from bottom. The trend is our friend. The economy is expanding. Earnings are going up and stock valuations are reasonable. But within those big trends, we have, you know, medium and short-term moves. And I just think that this move uh, up to these new highs is probably going to be played out pretty soon. And we just take a little bit of a pullback here and some of the overextended stocks will be beaten up and people rotate their money to the ones that uh, look more attractive. And then we go another leg higher as the economy continues to expand. Some people might ask, how can corporate earnings be doing so well with a GDP growth of under 2 percent? Yeah. Uh, the two very clear reasons for that. One is that a, a good deal amount of the shortfall in this recent GDP report was from government spending. Uh, that is considered very transitory. I mean, our government really, as we know, is, hasn't really stopped spending that much. And, and so that can quarter over quarter be very choppy, but you know, most people expect that to come back to normal ranges in future quarters. So if you take a look at the other aspects of GDP, it was really more like, and consider where the consumer is at and other aspects, it was like a three reading. It was really the government that pulled it down to a uh, two. Uh, secondly, uh, how can corporate earnings um, be looking so much better than GDP is that so much of the earnings are coming from abroad. So the expansions in China, Brazil, uh, India, and so on is adding to the profits of our multinationals. And, and so uh, I've seen where maybe 40 plus percent of their profits are coming from abroad. And that's where you can get a little bit of a disconnect from the local economy uh, versus what they are achieving abroad. You know, you really like investing using earnings estimate revisions, uh, talking about earnings uh, as a guide. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the most fundamentally sound approach. I mean, when we're buying companies, we are buying ownership stakes in them, and, and the earnings of the company is what we're most interested in. But it's, but it's not just the earnings that have been, gen been generated in the past. is what are the future prospects? So earnings estimates is the best possible way of taking a look at the future projections of where things are going. And if those projections are going higher, then the investors will be attracted to that and, and the company's uh, share prices will go higher. If those estimates are going lower, that's that there's a warning signal being put in there and, and that those stocks are most likely going to underperform for a stretch. So most fundamentally sound approach for the way that the stock market really works. And is that why investors then need to make earnings estimate revisions their friend, so to speak? Yeah. It, the, the beauty is, it's not just, you know, it's, it's not a, um, it's not just one way in which to invest. Meaning 
that each different investor, we have different things we like. I'm a value guy, uh, and other people might be momentum, chartist, uh, growth and income kind of folks. And the thing is, you can start with earnings estimates as your guide to which companies are having the, the best uh, improvement in prospects, then layer over these additional ingredients of value or growth or or charts, and then find the ones that meet your unique criteria. So I, I think it's really something that fits most every kind of investor, except for day traders. Yeah. Okay. What's on the week, uh, the docket for the week ahead? Yeah. Uh, very clearly, the focus is going to be on employment next week. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your intro uh, that the jobless claims kind of picked up a little bit in the, in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, and so people are going to want that. Uh, to be a, a good sign that, okay, that was just a little blip in the jobless claims. Where's the monthly report at? Are we adding jobs? And that will be very uh, telling about what future GDP is. More people having jobs, more income, more spending, higher GDP. Okay, see you a little bit later. We'll see you coming up next after this message. Here is your Bull and Bear Stock of the Week. An integrated oil company and a major bank are this week's bull and bear of the week. Shiraz Mian here with us now to fill us in on which is which. Well, the integrated oil company is PetroChina, uh, which is traded here under the ticker PTR as an ADR. That's right. So why is this a bull? It's a play on both oil as well as China. And uh, it's the better of the three Chinese oil companies. And why it's better of the three Chinese? The three Chinese, PetroChina, Sinuk, and Sinopec. Uh, uh, PetroChina has the best oil assets uh, in, uh, in, in China. Uh, the, the quality of an oil asset is what we call as the reserve production ratio. Uh, which in plain English basically means how long it takes the oil company to suck the oil dry off the ground. PetroChina's assets will take 13 years. The other two Chinese companies will take nine and seven years respectively. So very good quality assets that brings down the oil price that it needs to keep drilling. Its, it's break-even price is somewhere in the $70 range compared to uh, much higher numbers for the others. Uh, on top of that, they have the, uh, the largest uh, natural gas reserves uh, in China. More than two-thirds of, in fact, the Chinese natural gas reserves uh, are within uh, PetroChina, which should give them 5-10% production growth rate over the next few years. They are building out the largest pipeline network in China which will go in sync with its natural gas and oil assets. So overall, uh, a very good play on the Chinese growth story as well as the overall momentum in oil. Okay. The major bank is Bank of America, BAC. What went wrong here? Uh, bank of America has a number of clouds on its core business which don't seem to be going away. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they haven't properly absorbed and digested the assets they acquired out of the, uh, the countrywide financial acquisition. Yeah. And the core business of extending loans to consumers and businesses, well, that's down for Bank of America and for everybody else. That business is further clouded by uh, this ongoing uh, mortgage weakness. On top of that, they have a lot more litigation risk than some of their their other peers. Mainly it, due to the countrywide assets. Uh, um, again, ma mainly due to the mortgage assets that yeah. they bought off of countrywide. And in addition to that, uh, they were unable to convince the Fed in the latest round of stress tests, which the banks went through in March, that we are strong enough that we could support a dividend to our shareholders. So it was, uh, it was a rude shock for Bank of America as well as for the market that the Fed said, no, you're not ready to, uh, to, to announce a dividend yet. But in fairness to them, the Fed said that, okay, you can come back. Uh, and go through again through the beauty test. And if you can convince us, we will let you 
Uh, so they are the only one of the major banks that haven't really come out and reinstated or increased their dividend, and that's another negative uh, is it gonna, for this. Is that going to be a longer road than maybe even they anticipated? Uh, most likely we should have more clarity on that in the second half of the year, but it appears to be. Uh, uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and the others are well on their way uh, for, uh, for, for normalized dividends, and Bank of America will be a laggard. Okay, we're going to screen for stocks right now. Screen of the Week, an overview of a timely strategy aimed at helping you become a more effective stock screener. This week we're talking about upgraded broker ratings with Kevin Matris, our top stock screener here. Okay, so stocks receiving upgraded broker ratings, right, right on the surface, seems simple. But is this a situation where the more of these kinds of stocks in your portfolio, the better? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm sure that we have all had the pleasure uh, of waking up one morning and seeing that a stock that we are in has been upgraded by a broker who's covering it. And usually that means the stock is going to have a good day that day and maybe even several more days to follow. Unfortunately, I think we've probably all had the experience and disple displeasure of seeing uh, uh, one of the stocks we are in downgraded by a broker as well. And usually that means the stock's going to have a rough day that day, maybe even several more days or weeks to follow if there's some meat behind the, uh, the downgrade. Mm -hmm. But while nobody can perfectly predict which company is going to have an upgrade, or how to guard against a downgrade. What's important is to know how the stocks react once you see these things. And that is what today's piece is all about. Well, staying in winners, getting out of losers definitely makes sense. Right. The, uh, the, the thing that I like to do uh, when I'm looking for stocks, especially around earnings season, is I want to find companies that have been recently upgraded by the brokers who are covering them. And the reason why that is so important is because studies have shown that companies that get upgraded usually outperform those with no upgrades at all, but they outperform even more companies that have been downgraded and usually by a pretty significant degree. And uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing and I have a, a study here that we're going to kind of go over. So check this out. Okay. What I did was I created three screens and I ran these tests over the last 10 years. The first screen has me looking at only broker rating upgrades. So again, there's been a positive change in the broker rating. Mm -hmm. The next screen is brokers that uh, haven't had uh, uh, an upgrade or a downgrade. So again, these stocks, nothing has happened. Whether the rating is good or bad, there has been zero change in the rating. Got it. And then the last screen has me looking at broker rating downgrades. So again, we're looking at a negative change in the broker rating. So I'm guessing that the upgrades beat the downgrades? Yeah, you'd be right on that. What was interesting is that the tests confirmed what I had already expected, but the magnitude of the change was much larger than I had expected. So check this out. If you were to look at the first screen, only those companies receiving upgrades, the average annual return was 10.4%. Pretty good. Then if you look at the ones with no upgrades or downgrades, those showed an average annual return of 6.1%. But then if you look at the ones that had received broker rating downgrades, now you're looking at the return of being minus 0.3%. So the takeaway is this. The stocks that received an upgrade performed nearly twice as good as those companies with no change at all, and they significantly outperformed those with downgrades. In fact, that was the difference between making making money and losing money. So very, very important. And what about specific stocks that were recently upgraded? Yeah, I just ran the screen this morning. So here's five stocks that came through. AK Steel Holding, Health Management, News Corp, Pitney Bowes, and Raw Corp. All of these companies have just recently seen broker rating upgrades. I think these are definitely companies to look at. And by the way, the last three, these are companies that are going to be reporting in the coming weeks. And do you own any? Uh, I do have health management. Okay. One of those all-season screens? All-season, something you want to run all the time. All right. Roundtable's next. Stick with us. Welcome to the Zach's Roundtable Review, a discussion of current events affecting investors as well as other topics of financial interest featuring the analysts and editors of Zach's.com. GDP, earnings, and the Fed, our pros weigh in, and they're here with us right now. Editor-at-large Steve Reitmeister, Research Director Shiraz Meehan, and Market Technician. 
Kevin Matris. Let's start with GDP. Kind of talked a little bit about it in the uh, in the first segment. 1.8 percent growth in the first quarter. What do you make of that? Yeah, it it, it was a little higher than the two percent consensus, but certainly within the realm of the expected. And, and you could see the market reaction after that. The, the market was up yesterday. Uh, it's slightly up as we're uh, speaking right now on Friday morning, and. Uh, it's because uh, it's a great Goldilocks scenario where the economy is expanding, maybe not at the most robust pace, but because it's not that robust, that the Fed's going to stay on easy street and continue to be accommodative. When you put those two things together, uh, a slightly improving economy and strong corporate earnings plus an accommodative Fed, it usually spells uh, good things for the stock market. Right. So slower than expected growth doesn't concern you at this point? Uh, no. Uh, if it continues at that pace, uh, then it certainly should pull down corporate earnings. But uh, most aspects that brought this thing down from the previous 3% range yeah. to, to this are considered to be transitory in nature, and we should be bouncing back up towards 3% uh, in future quarters. This was a big concern, Shiraz, a uh, quarter ago, as recent as a quarter ago. Can the economy sustain that growth that they were talking about back then? I guess now we're finding out the answer. Uh, it is. Uh, the, the concern, uh, I think, the, uh, the, what's pushing the stocks higher, uh, even at this, uh, uh, this sub-2% uh, GDP growth number, is this view that this is temporary. And it's not going to last uh, in the rest of the year. And if this view prevails, uh, and it turns out that expectations for Q2 in the second half are not coming down, uh, then probably this, uh, what I call as this, uh, this uh, transitory narrative, then it probably makes sense. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, concerning in my view. Uh, the slowdown, it's, it's, it's less than half of what we were expecting yeah. uh, three months ago. Uh, but at this stage, it has had no impact whatsoever on corporate earnings, right. and uh, the market's uh, just loving the way the earnings are coming up. So, Kevin, you don't see all of this news coupled with the uh, jobless claims news out this week as dampening investor spirit here at all? You know, it would have been better if we had better reports, right, a better jobless claims number, a better GDP. But the reason why I think the market is going higher and there isn't too much concern over GDP, because, yeah, it, it was transitory in nature, i.e. energy, but a lot of the underperformance came from reduced government spending. And I'd much rather see reduced government spending than reduced private sector spending. So if you were to look at the internals of the GDP, uh, personal spending was up, business spending was up, uh, inventory building was up. So all in all, I think the GDP was fine, and I think you're going to continue to see that grow as the year progresses. Steve, what about that Fed news conference this week? Was that like the biggest non-event? Right. I mean, we, <laughs> we I talked about it a little bit in my commentary during the week. So yes, it was historic that no other previous Fed president had done that, but there was no way that he wasn't going to say things, I mean, there was no way he was going to say things that hadn't been signaled uh, in the past. And, and so uh, he was already the most transparent Fed president uh, coming in, or Fed chairman coming into this event. Uh, he just proved it once again that, you know, he just, he just wants to be as clear as possible about the policies because academic studies show the clearer the Fed is, the more likely people are to interpret it properly, what they're doing, That's right. and, and that the strategies they're doing will have the most benefit for the economy. Right. So kind of a non-event, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, well, look what the stock market but, is like, okay, that was nice. Now let's move on and see what earnings and GDP are like. But if that's true, because uh, you guys are both agreeing here, if that is true, what he says, he's already a transparent guy, right? Right. Does he need a news conference? <laughs> he, he needed to explain, come out, and tell the folks, uh, basically educate them, uh, that it's coming to an end, uh, the, the quantitative easing program is coming to an end in June, uh, and why we don't need another one. And we needed to hear that from the Fed. Another positive that thing that came out of the confer news conference was he explained what the uh, extended period right. language meant in the statement. He said it'll take them a couple of meetings, uh, meaning about two, th two and a half to three months' time right. before they will change their tone and the stance of monetary policy. So some positive things came out which helped the market uh, digest the whole monetary policy scenario better. Okay, right. so he, he didn't tip his hand to QE3 is what you're saying, but... He rolled it out. Okay. Right. Kevin, did he actually ignite the next leg up on the market? You know, maybe he did. 
I don't know. <laughs> the thing that's interesting is that, yeah, he's giving the market a heads up, and I think that that is fantastic. So that was probably the most uh, transparent part of the conference. It was a little disappointing in the sense that, you know, he said there's really nothing that can be done on the jobs front. He does expect to see the jobs market steadily improve, but yeah, he did rule out Q, uh, QE3. Um, but, uh, but giving the market what it wants, letting them know what's going to be coming down the pike, I think is a good thing. And I think that that is helpful to the market. All right. I do not believe he ruled out QE3. He said, it's not currently on the slate. I'll do whatever is necessary. It's not necessary right now. But that's not, that's not ruling it out. It's just saying it's not loaded up and ready to go in June. Yeah, is he, what it, but, but, uh, but I'll do it if, if we need to, is what he said. He, he mentioned that the benefits from another round of easing would be outweighed by like what the, the inflationary right. pressures that are building up. And that was my take that he's ruling it out. Okay. Got to get some stock picks. <laughs> stock picks. Give, give us yours. Okay. Eaton, uh, industrial, multinational, uh, because of the cheaper dollar, great for an exporter like this. A lot of late cycle business streams. Uh, I think very attractive uh, at this time. Shiraz? Very fun. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a point of sale. Uh, uh, terminals, uh, producer, designer, installer. Uh, they made an excellent acquisition a few months back, which is giving them uh, the, the weak spot that they had in Europe. They have awesome growth opportunities in emerging markets. The stock is on a tier, but it's not just momentum. They have solid fundamentals driving them. Okay, Kevin. I was all ready to talk about uh, the earnings season. Either way, my uh, ticker well, we did is a little bit. It's, uh, it's Foot Locker. They are a retailer of athletic footwear. Real quick, solid double digit projected growth rates, fantastic valuations. My price target right now is $25. That is a 16% increase from here, but I think it can go much higher than 25. And since you brought it up, give us a quick rate on earnings season two weeks in. There were 73% uh, of the companies no, posted no, positive earnings. What's surprises. your grade? Fantastic. Okay, Shiraz. Your grade. Very good. Uh, B plus A minus. Okay. Now you've heard what our pros have to say. Hope that helps you. We'll see you next time on Profit from the Pros.